the HBCU football whisperer. I know what you call him, <laughs> but, but BJ, he's the football whisperer, so I'm going to call him that. <laughs> oh, no doubt, no doubt. I like that. I like that. Go add that to the lexicon. Hey, Alan, he's in your part. What'd you say? Hey, <laughs> bro, you got to make sure you uh, go and get you a loose burger from Lafayette, Coney Island down the street there. You know, that's, right. that's what Detroit is. Don't get the American, get the Lafayette. And by you there, bro, I know you got your boys with you. You're downtown. Think about the historic Alpha House, man. 411. Uh, I think it's on Elliott Street. 4, 411 Elliott. So gotcha. Yeah, I've been there. there with note, that, uh, right that, up the street that, for you. Historic sign in front of it, man. You can't get that. You got to get your picture in front of that. Yeah. BJ, the internet shit happened. They got to do it. Love there, but, you know, we show love for our cage side brothers up there. Uh, so we're going to give you a shout out, <laughs> BJ Jones. Plus, you just coming off a great Saturday victory. So, not too much gonna spoil it for you, man. How you doing, BJ? Man, I'm doing good, man. It's good to wake up on a Sunday like this, man, coming off a big rain. I suppose it's you know to the one a couple of weeks ago we lost to Arkansas Pine Bluff. So feeling good, yeah, man. I, feeling good. I know off the off the off the path, we talked about it. You sure would like to get that one back, I'm sure. The way they yes. playing right now. I bet we'd love to have that game back. <laughs> yeah, man. That's how it goes sometimes. Charles, it looked like you probably want some games back too. How you doing this morning? Uh, it's a rough morning, Dr. Bill. I can't lie to you. Uh, I might sign off after about 10 minutes. So I can go to church. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's rough, man. It's rough. And, and I, I tell you what, I, I woke up this morning to, uh, I don't know, at least about seven people in my inbox, you know, venting and frustrated. And this. <laughs> I have to let everybody know that's going to jump in my inbox today. I'm going to be on the golf course later, so I can't even talk to you. So <laughs> it is going to be what it is. So. Yeah, I know how you relax. You go hit the golf course, and they just sign off. So I catch you when I get back. Don't worry about me. I'm real much. <laughs> yeah, I certainly understand that in so many different ways. With that said, let's jump right into it. We're talking about this matchup. In a lot of ways, the game of the day, many people thought was Zach State Southern. And it showed up in a lot of ways for the Southern Jaguars. They certainly made it their game of the day as they dominated this matchup in so many different ways. It was close early, and Jackson State found a way to kind of stick around, even though Southern just continued to make plays, and they pushed them around. Let me give you some of the key stats that took out to me, and we can go around the square, if you would, to see what everybody thinks to some degree. Uh, for example, first downs, 26 to 16. Third down efficiency was big, 14 of 20, one of eight, and even on fourth down, as Jack State chose to go for it twice with 0 and 2. So combined one of 10 trying to get it done in terms of some type of efficiency tells you a lot. Total yards, 474 to 309. We'll break that down a little more after you give me some thoughts. Let me go straight to B.J. Jones in terms of what the HBCU whisperer uh, football whisper in a lot of ways. What was his thoughts in terms of this matchup? What stood out to you? Uh, the fashion that Southern was able to dominate up front on the offensive line and defensive line, uh, you know, that really stood out. Um, also, it was Jackson State's uh, inability to extend drives and defensively their inability to get Southern off the field, even when Southern was in a couple of second and long and third and long. And after today, are uh, at those home, were real but when you look at the records of these three the games front. and their opponents, uh, you had the onside kick one. cover. They got a tough uh, Southern really dominated well, all Dawson three Well, Dawson Odoms told us that, you know, they've got defense a great gumbo. Great and that was surprising to see. Players are coming out of the backfield. Jared Sims is one of those players so many guys there, so so motion. You know, they give it to Ben this time good point let me go no straight to you Charles in terms of on the <laughs> opposite the side uh, of well, the ball the greatest runners of all time State, what were some of the things uh, that concerned Indeed, you little, uh, based on what DJ oh, just said about the Southern in terms of Jackson from Southern State coming out of the great and if it was 10 yards Good. Especially in the trenches, offensive line, Southern with uh, the ball. defensive okay, line, catching the Tigers uh, and special teams. Uh, there is there's no much control earlier. From. They're uh, giving there that is much reality to uh, Southern uh, overdrive. And then dropping back another two and a half. That's uh, and, and 12 points a meter. Onside kick. Uh, uh, 
You're not supposed to be able to cover a kid. Well done 13 yards uh, down. So and they, they were saying something the schematically. Uh, they saw the something drive. schematically. And, uh, if they give us that much cushion, go for it. Post game press conference. It was though. It was as though the team came out flat. I don't know how that happened. I think, I think, I think you have to come the football by John Lampley. Yeah, because the way Charles Williams ended that, CB, love you. But we, we even talking about decibel levels in the really crowd. Really making him pay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where we're going? <laughs> that's, 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 that's,
the big dogs up front from Southern dominated. End of story. Now, the other thing that you got to pay attention to is Jackson State special teams. Now, Coach Prime <laughs> has only been there, what, six months? Yeah. So, you know, who comes in, in in the first six months already in the middle of a season, right? So you got to remember why they made the coaching change in the first place. Jackson State fans, calm down. How quickly y'all forgot where y'all were last year in 2019, the last time we had football. There was a reason why you had a coaching change. Get this man a shot to get some talent in place. You didn't have any talent. And now you want to beat up on – you want to be mad because you lost to Southern? Yeah, R-E-L- R-E-L-A-X. Relax. Yeah, no, I see Relax. it. This was, no, I can see it. This no, was Valley, no, but come no, on, man. Chill out. Sounds like you need to tell JSU to get off the ledge, man. Uh, I think there is a faction of the fan base, the I told you so faction. Uh, they're pretty active today. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, and it's nothing, and, and, that, and that's fair. Uh, criticism, uh, criticism is fair. I don't have any, any issue with that. But in, in some ways, you do have to keep things in perspective, and that's not what fans do. And I understand that. That's just, you know, that's, there's a reality to that. Yeah. Before we move on to the next matchup, I do want to get B.J. Jones back here and talk about this. What are your thoughts on this this court this quarterback controversy? I know Mike is over there at Prairie. They love the quarterback controversy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why he brings it up. He just don't want to be out there alone. <laughs> quarterback controversy. But now we're gonna go to BJ Jones. He's the quarter, he's the HBCU football whisperer. So if anybody knows, he should know. Give us some. All signs out of camp is that you haven't seen the, the Southern star quarterback yet this spring, mm. which a lot of people anticipated was going to be Glendon McDaniel, also known as Bubba McDaniel. Uh, he was a guy that was the talk of. Wow. Was the talk hold on, of the hold practice. on. Oh, where's my microphone? Where's my microphone? <laughs> Did he just drop the mic? <laughs> Go he ahead. dropped it and it broke. It dropped. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, he was the talk of of the, I guess you call it the winter camp. Uh, he ended up having to have surgery. It's going to be out all spring. Uh, so, essentially, what you saw was quarterback two and three um, mm. on yesterday. Um, and I, I think with Ladarius Skelton, I think you have to look at his athleticism, what he does and what he brings to the table. And then with Lampley, what he brings with his arm. I think, um, you know, with that quarterback situation, that's a tough. That's a tough decision because you have the guy who was a presumed starter who lit it up by you know all intents and purposes during practice. He ended ends up having to have a surgery. He's out for the spring, and now you have two and three uh, playing the way that they are. It's going to be very interesting. I don't think you'll get an answer until the fall, gotcha. uh, and, and even in the fall, I would suspect you would still see a lot of Ladarius skills. Yeah, I mean, he does a lot of things well. And there's something about the way that he gets that team the fight that I think that you cannot take for granted. So there may be some things that you don't see uh, on the field that frustrates or concerns, but there's something about the way that he gets that team to lead and show that framework that I think captures that. But we're going to move on to the next game, but I'm going to let Charles jump in here and say uh, something that he wants to bring. But I also yeah. wanted to talk about what Alan said in regards to the East and West. One thing that you can and be excited about, Jack, uh, I mean, in, ter- in terms of Charles, is the fact that you all in the East division. Because I think those in the West, you should have some major concern because I don't know what's going to go on in the West in terms of the talent that's over there between Southern, talking about they're moving forward, Pine Bluff, figuring it out, Prairie View in the mix. Grambling is down, but that's not going to stay down too long. Boy, if you're Texas Southern, uh, ooh, that's scary. And we forgot the fact that they're bringing all corn state over to the West. Oh, Lord. Charles, yeah. go ahead. No, I mean, uh, to, to your point about the Swag East and Swag West, I wouldn't discount the Swag East so, so quickly because I think Alabama a and Alabama State, and Jackson State are all formidable teams. So, uh, But to your point, Swag West, you know, Southern – UAPB now. I don't know where Gremlin is within the Pantheon, but I think, you know, with Noah Biden coming in the fall, that should be pretty interesting. But Swag West is going to be formed. But BJ, help me out with this because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Dawson Odom fan. And uh, to me, he has always had his teams prepped and ready to go. Why sometimes is there angst with Dawson Odom's 
teams, or, or, or how does that happen sometimes? You talking about the fan base, right? Yeah, yeah. fan base. Yeah. Well, that was a that was a segment of Jaguar fans that have never been on the Dawson Odom's bandwagon. Um, he is not a he's not going to win any press conferences. He's not going to be flashy. Um, especially when you guys brought in Deion Sanders. A lot of people, see, see, that's what we need to do. That's what we do. He's not going to do any of those things that are going to bring any type of attention to his team outside of what happens on the football field. And so for some people, that's bored. Um, he doesn't have an offense that's going to score 58 points per game. So, and to some people, that's boring. He's a boring guy by a lot of people's standards, and that's why you have some people who have never been on his bandwagon, even yeah. in, the, in the years that we, the year we won the championship or been to the championship game, uh, they still mm. are not on the bandwagon. Mm. Man, great points, boy. I tell you, mm. there's a lot of fan bases out here that would love to be bored. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I, can think of, I, can, I can think of one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. With that, let's switch gears. Let's go into the OBC, Tennessee State. Man, they bounced back last week and got a win. That's two out of three that they're going. They were playing a Tennessee Tech team that came in one and four. So you're like, hey, man, they're going to get to uh, three and three. They'll be 500. They'll be rolling. No, not so fast. Uh, Tennessee Tech dominates Tennessee State 24 to 10, and it was a little more dominating than the score. Look, um, Tennessee State scored a touchdown late in that game um, to make it look like maybe that they were going to be a push to make it maybe interesting, but not so fast. First down in, the, in that matchup, Tennessee Tech 15 to 10. They scored early and often, really shut down the running game um, for Tennessee State and the passing game. Check this out. Passing total yards, 159 total yards. For Tennessee State, I mean, they did that last week just in terms of rushing, uh, passing for 89 yards, rushing for only 70 yards, but they allowed 202 rushing yards. Let me say that again. The Tennessee State defense allowed 202 rushing yards while Tennessee Tech was able to pass for 168. So they put up a total of 370 yards. So when I say they dominated that game, they dominated that game. I'm going to go to you, Allen, uh, with uh, you having uh, – brothers that went to Tennessee State. What are your thoughts on this matchup? And are you hearing <clears throat> from the fans over there at Tennessee State? Well, I, it, this game was never close. I think it was like 24 to 3 going into the fourth quarter. It was it was never close. Tennessee Tech comes in on a four-game losing streak and they got well against Tennessee State. So <laughs> you never want a team to get well on you like that. <laughs> It was just terrible, man. Isaiah Green had a decent day passing, but they just could not find a, a running game. Again, Tennessee State ends up with 70 yards rushing. You cannot win a football game with 70 yards rushing. Your defense is going to be on the field all day, which means the opposing offense is putting up them numbers. And that's exactly what they did. Look, they, they, they had a four-pronged rushing attack. They had Kurt Taylor. Eight attempts, 67 yards, one touchdown. Jordan Brown, uh, 1959, uh, you had quarterback Willie Miller uh, and wide receiver Quentin Cross. They all piled on and put up all conference numbers on Tennessee State. You can't win games like that, man. You can't put up games like that. No, no you're right. Let me go back to B.J. Jones. Third down efficiency. We're going to see a little bit about this, of course, of much of the day. We sell this with Jackson State. Well, Tennessee State does, decides to go 4 of 13 on third down and 0 and 1 on fourth. So, 4 for 14 in terms of the efficiencies of the day is not going to get it done in a lot of ways. BJ Jones, what were your thoughts of this matchup in this game? The biggest thing with Tennessee State, man, is that up front, the offensive line got dominated. Um, you know, that was one thing. And then I, I don't think Tennessee State really knows where they want to go from the quarterback position. There we go. Um, I don't exactly. think that no one has been really efficient in that position. Uh, so I think that that's also an issue. And I th think that defensively, they looked a little slow to the ball yesterday um, against, you know, uh, Tennessee Tech when, when Tennessee Tech had the ball on the ground. They look a little bit slow to the ball. And even late, late into that ball game, to be honest with you, there was a lot of people at Tennessee State defense that looked disinterested in tackling anybody. 
Uh, so I was not <laughs> expecting to see that from Tennessee State, looking at how they played last week uh, and then coming back into this week with Tennessee Tech, who was on the four-game losing streak. Man, I'm going to go to you, Mike, and then Charles, because it looked like <laughs> top three when you talk about uh, what they're doing specifically from the quarterback position. Um, 13 to 25. Yeah, yards per pass, three point six yards per pass, Mike. Yeah, uh, yeah, but m much to what was said uh, on uh, before me, and now you had a team on a four-game losing streak that has maneuvered its way to ensure that it at least gets this whatever Sergeant York Trophy, which uh, goes back to uh, Cookville with the with the title. It's like a four-team round robin in the state of Tennessee a team that is on a four-game losing streak. And to me, this statement epitomizes it all. T T Tennessee State found the end zone with six minutes left in the game. The game was practically over. And 70 yards rushing, uh, they, uh, you, talk, you, didn't, you did mention um, possession of the game, time of possession. I think uh, Tennessee Tech had the ball for 10 minutes more. And that third down, that, that wasn't even 50%. That wasn't 30% on third down efficiency. And I agree with what BJ <clears> said. I don't know. I, I don't know who I was looking at. I saw glimpses in the title. I was like, who is this Tennessee State team? Who are they? What do they want to be when they grow up? Because um, seriously, they were moving lethargically. So I, I, I do have some concerns if I'm Tennessee State going forward. Yeah, Charles, you talk about those numbers. Uh, Tennessee State falls to two and four. Uh, that is also two and four in the conference, but they're 0 and three on the road. Two victories at home can't get it done on the road at all. Tennessee State, uh, Tennessee Tech um, goes to two and four and two and one um, at home. So they're getting it done at home, even though they can't win on the road. So, what are your thoughts in terms of Tennessee State, Charles? It's a bad loss, and uh, and, uh, and the anti Rob Reed faction is very active this morning. Um, uh, <laughs> they get to go back, go in hard again. Um, the, the, and when I got the stat sheet on this game yesterday, the thing that jumped out immediately was Devon Starling. Uh, only uh, eleven attempts, thirty rushing yards, and it was it's such a a switch from the prior week where he was co op uh, OBC Player of the Week, and I just could not figure out, uh, you know, t Tennessee State doing sort of this um, heckle and jive uh, sort of deal, you know, uh, where uh, they look much better the past prior two weeks. And then, you know, they fall flat again yesterday against Tennessee Tech, a game that I thought, you know, would have kind of greased the wheels to get them back going again. And uh, this is a, a big setback. And like you said, BJ, uh, they're not settled at the quarterback position. Uh, to me, what has been their identity for some time now is being able to run football. Uh, they weren't able to do it yesterday. So it's, it's, they, they got to find some pieces. They got to find something up there. Chris Rowland ain't walking back in the door. So I, I don't I don't know what Tennessee State can do with regards to uh, trying to get things back right again. But it, it's it's shocking. And I heard from my Tennessee State buddy this morning, you know, that they're up in arms uh, with this loss of Tennessee Tech. Ricky Burton, Tennessee State needs to be in the sweat. Ah, man, playing like that, I don't know if anybody going to try to recruit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, I, and to be honest, I don't know mm -hmm. if they want any of the swag smoke. I don't, right? Yeah, I don't think they want that smoke from the swag. <laughs> Let's go to the MEAC since we're talking about uh, outside of the swag play before we get back into it. Quietly, uh, obviously, the MEAC is not playing a season, but they have three teams playing football, and all three teams played yesterday. They had a ma uh, matchup between conference members with Delaware State dominated Howard for the second time this season, 37-28. Uh, to 28. Um, the first game, they didn't necessarily dominate, uh, but this one, they certainly did. Uh, Howard scored late to make it a little closer than it should be, but even in the first quarter, 10-6, second quarter, 7-8, where uh, Howard did outscore them, but then the third quarter is where they pulled away 10-6, and then in the fourth, final frame, they outscored Howard again, 10-8. So you have your final score, 37-28. Uh, with that matchup, uh, so many different ways that the uh, Delaware State really dominates. When you talk about it, they put up 394 out, uh, yards. Howard did put up 370 yards, but it was kind of empty yards and then not being able to get it done in so many different ways. Um, with that said, 
Let me go straight to you, Charles, in regards to any thoughts in terms of this matchup. Early morning game, was it that Howard just wasn't ready to play that early in the morning? Or, uh, what happens there? Because they're kicking off uh, first thing in the morning, like 12 noon in a lot of ways. It's good because you get to see all the games in there. I got to see it full time. What are your thoughts in terms of that matchup? I got to start paying attention a little bit more to Delaware State because they, they – the, you don't want you know to fall into that you know not looking at what they're doing. That was a nice win against Howard, uh, but I, I I have to be honest with you. That was one of the games that that slipped through the cracks for me. And I looked up and saw I was like, wow, Delaware State played, and I don't want them to have that valley sort of something that you know that that catches me off guard from time to time. So uh, kudos to Delaware State in terms of getting that win. Uh, and you know I. We'll see what they're doing with their athletic department and how, where they're trying to build. I think those are very interesting storylines coming out of Delaware State uh, moving forward because, you know, you, you like to see all of your HBCU teams, you know, have a, a level of some success. No doubt. You talk about the changes. Uh, you talk about the athletic director retiring <clears throat> and changes on the basketball side between the men's and women's coach. Um, so it'll be interesting. A uh, foot is a change in the Delaware State. Uh, so it'll be interesting. Remember, they acquired the private school in that area, uh, shut down their athletic department in, in the process. So it's interesting to see what all these changes mean for Delaware State. Let me go to our uh, HBC Whisperer and get his thoughts before we finalize it with Mike and Allen in terms of this particular game. I mean, the biggest thing that I saw yesterday is, first of all, man, Howard's uniform change. I like that that new Howard uniform, man. That's what that's a classic uh, sleek look that they have, and that's the good thing that I'm going to say about Howard today. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, for Howard it was coulda, woulda, shoulda. Uh, they had a few passes with they, they would have connected on, would have gave would have given them uh, you know uh, opportunities to score more. Either the passes were dropped, overthrown. Uh, it was just a bad day, and they could not stop uh, Delaware State uh, defensively. Uh, the Howard defense couldn't get off the field. Uh, Delaware State controlled the ball game, and it was able to walk out of there uh, with a win that was actually – that game was a lot more dominant for Delaware State than that score appears to be. Agreed, 100, 150%. Let me, go, let me go to you, Mike, in terms of that. Now we're talking about Howard's uniform. Man, y'all going to get me back into <laughs> – talk about their uniforms as people talk about but the best thing he could <laughs> bj jones said he could say about please how- don't let us get on the uniforms <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation you're right i will leave that right there we'll park that maybe to later this week uh, i don't get into that but he <laughs> bj let me say this he said yeah that's bj jones the whisper he said the best thing he could say about how was the uniform yes they followed the over two on this uh Small season, if you would. Um, 0-1 at home, so can't get it done on home, can't get it done on the road. They just need to stop playing Delaware State. Can they play anybody else? Maybe that will help. Delaware State improves the 2-1 and 1-1 and one and one, uh, away uh, uh, from home as they lost the game earlier to South Carolina State. They played well in the game, and we'll get into that next in terms of Alabama State. But before we do that, I'm going to stick with you, Mike. Tell me any thoughts you have in terms of Delaware State and Howard. Yeah, there's nothing good. I mean, I I think that game was a lot more dominant than than, than what the score even reveals. 37-28, you think, okay, Howard had some chances, but they really never had chances. Jared Lewis, 173 <laughs> yards, no interceptions, ball security. How about that? And three TDs. Heck, even the even the field goal kicker had a had a banner day with three field goals. Jose Romo Martinez had a banner day. Uh, Sivion Wilkes rushed for 112 yards on, on 22 carries. That's five yards of rush. Everybody got some of that to, yes, yesterday. So it really wasn't close. Uh, and you talk about time of possession, that wasn't even close. So it was a lot closer. I mean, Howard's scores looked like first quarter, six points, second quarter, eight points, third quarter, six points, fourth quarter, eight points. So it was <clears> – <throat> they really couldn't do anything offensively. So – <clears throat> That's about all I could say with that performance yesterday. And yes, I do like the Under Armour, <clears throat> the Under Armour uniforms. I do like those, and I'm wearing those versus that red that Jackson State is going with. <laughs> hey, let me let me, let me help all let me help all the anti-red people. That is 
That is W.C. Gordon Red. Okay, I've oh. rebranded it for you. I, yeah. I've given you, you know, what it is. It is an accent color. It's okay. Just, you, just calm how down. You, how you gonna put a brand on a primary color? Uh, you can because that's what smart <laughs> like, departments do. You, that's, you, you rebrand. That's you like allow me, for it to happen. That's like me saying Mike, oh, Wash, man, Mike Washington Black. Good. Change is good. Everybody knows we're blue and right. I might as well say Mike Washington Black. I mean, oh Lord, <laughs> oh Lord, uh, I'm losing, I'm losing control of the train quick. Alan, help me out. All you, right, man. Listen, that's, Howard, are you going to talk about the Bison Burger as well? I'm staying away from the Bison Burger. So listen, <laughs> uh, Delaware State. It is the tale of Jared Lewis. Mm -hmm. To Troy Gross. Yeah. I mean, Troy Gross went off five receptions, 123 yards. His average yards per catch was 24 and a half with three touchdowns. The boy went crazy yesterday, man. That was the matchup. And then, like you said, Mike, with Savion Wilkerson with 112 yards and a touchdown. And then you got Jose uh, Roma Martinez with three of three with a long of 46 yards. I mean, the offensive coordinator. He, des he deserved to get that a nice bottle of single malt after that game and just Absolutely. sit back in the cut and, and be like, bro, y'all got the day off tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson, Charles Bishop. We have our special guest in here, as always, on our weekend edition, B.J. Jones. And then he, we brought in uh, another gentleman, Alan Williams, to help us back up as we had a full slate of games to talk about it. We're going to take a quick break here at Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab, and then we'll wrap up with the last couple of games. We'll go outside of the SWAC or inside the SWAC with the MEAC SWAC matchup, sticking with the MEAC, and give you some insight on that. And then we'll close with our final game, which was a SWAC matchup with Pine Bluff and Valley. Yeah, as Mike would say, Valley. Yeah, that's Valley. 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 <laughs> he played with Valley. We talking Valley? Talk talk Valley? Really? <laughs> We are. This is the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, BJ Jones, and Alan Williams. We'll be right with you. Stick with us as we come back right after this break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Support the Black College Sports Network so we can continue to provide you coverage. Go to myjbn.com slash support and be a part of the Black College Sports Tell everybody Network. they can follow their dreams. Your ad could be ran here. MyJBN.com backslash support. MyJBN.com backslash support for more information. It's like a loot machine. Washington Charles Bishop with our sidekicks of EJ Jones and Alan Williams for this weekend edition. Let's jump right back into it. Uh, a lot of people are excited when you get those MEAC SWAC interconference matchups between the two conference games. Obviously, we had South Carolina State show up against Alabama AM. Oddly, that's the only game that Alabama AM has been able to play this season uh, thus far. And it was a game that was scheduled after uh, a game was postponed. So They've had five games postponed, including one of them that was canceled. But with that, let's jump back to Alabama State. Played really well against Jackson State two weeks ago. Got off to a really good start against Pine Bluff before it was canceled because of the storms. Well, not so much against South Carolina State. They lose 14-7. to A defensive uh, slugfest in so many different ways. Um, South Carolina State was just 4-14 on third down. While uh, Alabama State was 4-16 as well, but 3-4 or four on fourth down. So they had to 
stretch it out. Did pretty good on fourth down efficiencies, but that's always a concern when you're having to go for it that many times on fourth down uh, in and of itself. Total yards, South Carolina State 222, uh, Alabama State 288. Hidden numbers in here that I saw was when Alabama State got in the red zone, they could not score. And when I say they could not score, not only could they not get the touchdown, but they had two missed field goals that were essentially extra points. That has to be a concern and frustrates you. They were one on two for extra points, uh, if I wasn't mistaken in that as well, in terms of what that looks like. So, man, a lot of things uh, that you were looking at Alabama State and taking the next step, and they just did not quite get it done. Let me go back to the whisper to get his insights in terms of this matchup because it was just strange in many different ways. What do you say, B.J. Jones? Man, it was very odd looking at the ball game. Uh, when I tuned in, South Carolina State was already up 7 nothing, And Alabama State's offense, they just seemed off yesterday. They moved the ball well at, at times, but yesterday they just seemed off. Ryan Nettles uh, wasn't his efficient self. Ezra Gray uh, wasn't able to break out like you thought that he should have. But I tell you that South Carolina State's front seven uh, looks like they, they're coming into their own. They replaced a lot of guys up there. But they're still athletic. They're still big. A little young. You may not know the names, but they really came into their own yesterday. And then Alabama State talked about the missed opportunities when they got in the red zone. Two drop catches uh, by Michael Jefferson, uh, which which was big. Then you had the missed field goals. One of them, South Carolina State, actually got a hand on. You look at it being a 14-7 loss. This game could have gone the other way. And if you're an Alabama State fan, you're looking at coulda, woulda, shoulda. You know, it's Jack, I mean, Alabama State coming off that high, that win against Jackson State, seeing how well they played last week against Arkansas by a bluff. And then this game, a game that everyone expected them to kind of run away with to lose this one, this really had to take some wins out of the sales for Alabama State. Yeah, no no doubt. In a lot of ways, you're looking up, representing the conference, get a chance to make a home statement for your fans again, and you fall flat in so many different ways. Let me go to you, Mike, in terms of that. And I see Charles shaking his head, so we'll go right back to him as well. Uh, but, Mike, what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? It just uh, was one of those games where you like you think that Alabama State Hornets are going to be able to turn it on at some point and find a way to struggle but get out with the win. Not <clears throat> be done. The defense makes a great play late in the game as they played well all game long, sets up the touchdown where Alabama State finally gets in, 7-7. You're like, okay, here we go. Good stop by Alabama State on the defensive side, and they can get in, maybe get a field goal somehow, get out of here with the victory. No, South Carolina State literally goes down the field. First time they were able to travel the field, and they get essentially what would be the winning touchdown. Alabama State has a last-ditch effort where they go back all the way down the field, and what happened to them the whole game happens again. They can't score in the red zone. Part of this uh, timing running out. But, uh, Mike, what were your thoughts in terms of this? Yeah, much the same to what uh, BJ was saying. I mean, if you look at the game, you look at it from a holistic standpoint, South Carolina State led for most of the game. They led for three quarters, but Alabama State had their opportunities, and like you alluded to, just could not take advantage. And if you'd have told me that Ezra Gray was going to finish the day with, what, 16, 17 rushes, only 36 yards, I would have, I would have said – uh uh-uh, uh, no. You right. literally want to. I yeah. I, I would have said no way, but that's exactly what happened. So, and you look at both teams total only four five hundred yards total offense for both. One team had 90, 90 yards rushing. The other team had ninety yards receiving. So they neutralized each other's. But it just it just seemed to me that I actually picked Alabama State to win, but they could not take advantage in the red zone. And unfortunately, that was much to their detriment. Uh, I thought, you know, Ryan Nettles had a fairly decent day. They had their spurts, but they just really couldn't capitalize and couldn't finish. Yeah, Jay Mack brought this up. South Carolina State beat Alabama State, one of the first Mac Swag Challenge games for you, historian. Check this out right here, Alan. You remember that? Just want to say thank sure. you for that gift. And it's <laughs> prominently displayed, as you can see right here. Um, that was a gift from Alan Williams taking you back there. What are your thoughts in terms of this game uh, between South Carolina State and Alabama State? 
So, I mean, these two teams were very evenly matched. It was clear because it was so back and forth the whole game. But you got to give it to Coach Buddy Poe. This is not the first time he's met Dr. Hill Ely. You go back to his Morgan State days, he mm-hmm. is now 10-1 and one since Dr. <laughs> oh, Hill Ely. Buddy so he, Yeah, but, but Buddy seems to have his number, man. He seems to have his number. So, And, and we talked about it earlier this week about – what team is going to show up for Alabama State? You know, I can't say they were not – they showed up unprepared. They just didn't execute. Yeah. That's shown with special teams. That's shown with, you know, him having to put in both quarterbacks trying to throw a kitchen sink at it just to make – give somebody – give them a spark. But, hey, man, it, it is what it is. And uh, hats off to SCSU for, for getting it done. I Sorry, heard the play of the game uh, for that game, not to cut you off, Doc, but no, there was a play. There was a play in the third quarter. Alabama mm-hmm. State was running the off the off tackle uh, play to Ezra Gray, and it was there. The hole was wide open. He hit the hole going a million miles an hour, and the defensive lineman lays out and literally gets a piece of the shoelace and trips him up. And that that run would have been a touchdown, uh, but end up going a three oh, yard that- game. That was synonymous on how that day went for Alabama State. Yep. Yeah, great point. I'm glad you snuck in there and put that in there because I saw that and I was like, oh, it's going to be one of those. Touchdown. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, touchdown. Swat going to be all right. We're going to get this victory. No, not so fast. But going to you, Charles, this defense, the defense that you see for South Carolina State, um, they just figured out. I don't understand how you can always have a great defense. South Carolina right. State for years. It doesn't matter who's the coach, it doesn't matter who's on the team. <clears throat> They may struggle on offense, but what you're not going to do against South Carolina State is put up a lot of points. They, you're going to be in a fight to get it done, which in a lot of ways gives a lot of credit to Alabama a and yeah. which we're still trying to figure out. But this is their first game. They just get off the bus, and they put up some points. Ah, that's going to be interesting. We'll talk about that a little later. But in terms of this matchup with South Carolina State, Alabama State, what do you say, Charles? in any direction, where do you want to go with this matchup? Well, I mean, didn't Dr. Uh, Hill Ely come on this program and and make mention to the fact of, of consistency with Alabama State, yeah. uh, knowing which Alabama State was going to show up? And I think that's the thing. If you're an Alabama State fan that frustrates you so, uh, they can look one way against a uh, uh, Jackson State, against the UAPB, and then come out and do this yesterday with South Carolina State. It's shocking. Uh, like you said, Mike, uh, if you told me Edward Gray would only have 36 yards, I would have laughed at you. Um, I just, I, from what I saw, I, um, I thought Alabama State was a team that had really turned the corner and, you know, was really one of those uh, ascendancy teams, if you will, in the SWAC, which, uh, you know, gives rise to me thinking the SWAC East was starting to make this metamorphosis with A&M and Alabama State and Jack State getting back into the game. So I didn't like this loss yesterday uh, to South Carolina State. Um, to only put up seven points, I, I thought I think Alabama State was way more explosive than that with Ezra Gray, Michael Jefferson, and and the sort of receivers that they have. So it, it's a real head scratch, and you just don't know what Alabama State team you're going to get from week to week. We might get an Alabama State team against Alabama A and M that looks, you know, that's up for that game. It's the Magic City Classic, but you got to have wins like this. You got to have these these South Carolina State wins where you know. I, South Carolina State is, is decent offensively, uh, I think, with Corey Fields and Shaq Davis, but I, 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 they're not an explosive sort of team. So uh, what we traditionally know South Carolina State for is having a really good defense. So uh, just, a, a, to, for me, a bad loss yesterday by Alabama State. Yep. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point when you talk about that. Uh, Barry jumps in here and says, Gray didn't have many yards against SU either. The other back, number two, hurt uh, Southern. Um, so, yeah, Gray – uh, people are starting to understand if you can stop him, maybe you can do a lot to stop the Alabama State Hornets, and certainly South Carolina State did just that. Alabama State falls to one and two. Uh, bigger than that is they are one and two at home. Man, that has to hurt. Uh, South Carolina State improves to two and one, and they're one and oh, uh, away game. So it'll be interesting to see what they're able to do as they try to close up the season as they will face Delaware State again uh, to make the, their statement to see what they do on the season. Um, with that being said, let's look at our last football matchup of the day, which was between Arkansas, Pine Bluff, and Valley. 
<clears throat> Charles said this, so I'm gonna start with Charles. Charles says, keep an eye on Valley. Mike is always like Valley, Valley. Pablo came in playing really well. They do improve the three and zero. A good team finds a way to get the win no matter what's going on, and they did just that. Valley goes to zero and two, playing much better in this game. First home game. Um, Pablo jumped out on. Them. Looked like they were maybe gonna win it going away. Valley pushes back and ties the game, but then allows a big. Uh, special teams play to really be the difference in that matchup. What's your thoughts on this 24 to 17 victory for Arkansas Pablo over Valley? You're just not going to go in and slap this Dancy's teams around. Uh, I really believe that. Um, and we kind of, I, I don't know, I, I understand, you know, people, it's Valley, it's Valley. I saw some things against uh, when Mississippi Valley played Jackson State that I was pretty impressed by. Uh, one of the things that was a red flag for me that it started to play out a little bit more now is, uh, Jackson State's offensive line couldn't get much of a push on, on Valley's defensive line. So, and, and they got you know some 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 pretty decent players on that side of the ball. One of the things I, I think where Valley's going to catch somebody sleeping, I think J- Jelani Easton is a heck of a ball player uh, from the quarterback position. He gives them a little bit of a dynamic where he can make some plays uh, where there are no plays to be made. So, I think Valley is is you know. It's still a, a work in progress, but don't sleep on them because they're going to catch somebody. I know it's going to happen, and they're going to catch a couple of people. And this and, and this dance is going to have their team ready to play week in, week out. They're soft. They they may catch somebody, but they don't have Texas Southern. So yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I, I'm not too sure about that, but a lot of people are chiming in about that defensive line front. As you said, defensively they will hold. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Now, if they can find a way to get some things on offense, they can be a little more potent in that. I saw B.J. Jones shaking his head, but I'm going to go to Mike because he likes to pick on Valley, so I want to see what he says uh, in terms of what his thoughts to counter Charles Bishop saying, hey, watch out for Valley, the Delta Delta. They go somebody flip. Yeah. What was the score at halftime? 17-3 in, in favor of UAPB. Yes. So every year – Every year for the last four or five years, you two will like watch out for Valley and Valley gonna come strong. I haven't seen it yet. I have seen some improvement. Uh, that defensive side of the ball you mentioned, not only a defensive line, but if you look at their backs, their defensive backs seem to be moving very well as well. But I haven't seen enough to say, okay, watch out for Valley. Like we have said with UAPB this year, UAPB kind of came out of nowhere this year. With, with their offense, especially with Skylar Perry playing the way he is and uh, Tyron Ralph, the receiver, they come out of nowhere. Valley is not to that point yet. If you look at where they are statistically, offensive, defensively, they're making some improvements, but I haven't seen nothing that leads me to say, to, to or at least stop saying, Valley? We talking about Valley? We talk practice? We talking about practice? I'm sorry. I just have yet to see it. So... <laughs> They may catch somebody on a bad day, but uh, if you look at it, Jackson State still, even even having some off plays, still performed well against Valley. Hey, in a tough environment and one in Valley. They put up 17 points in that first half. Now they kind of, I don't know if they let off the gas or, or Valley just, you know, they got a good halftime speaking to, but, you know, they came out, Valley came out hot in that second half to kind of to tie it up at 17, but then special teams, special teams. Punt return for a touchdown, seal the deal. UAPB. Yeah. Yeah, we keep saying it. And BJ Jones, you talked about that in this shortened season in regards to fans just understanding it. Well, UAPB uh, found a way to win. Um, was it pretty? No. Did they earn style points? No, but they're at this point where it's survive and advance. The only thing that you need to do is win. Um, this only thing that you need to do is win. You have to close the door. Uh, one of the things that I like is they closed out when they needed to. They didn't play mm-hmm. the best sex that they have on the outside. I, I mean, I like UAPB a lot. With Valley, their front seven, uh, I like those guys up front. You know, I wish that they had Valley. Uh, but, you know, I, I like that front seven. And then with special teams, we focus Arkansas Pine Bluff with the special team blunders in, in that mm. game, giving up field position, giving up a block punt and so forth. So I think especially in the spring, 
you naturally you want to focus on offense and defense, but you have to have that third part of the game, special teams locked down, because it will make or break you, especially when offensive and defensively, you're in a tight, uh, tightly contested game. Yeah, I think that's the quote of the day. First, we uh, fascinating as we start to see maybe that pitcher really uh, play itself out. Uh, you have Mississippi Valley at Alabama State, which to me now becomes a lot more interesting. Just the way you're going to try to figure out which team you're going to get from Alabama State. Um, are they frustrated about thinking uh, uh, it's out of it? But also to their credit, they have everything in front of them. So coach can say, hey, we're right in the mix in regards to being able, if we play beat the team in front of us, Alabama a and for the Magic City Classic, we can still have uh, control of our destiny in a lot of ways to play for the championship game. But Valley is like, hey, we're playing good football. We're going to go into Montgomery and get it done. It sounds like uh, <laughs> Alabama State gets uh, all these home games. That's pretty uh, fascinating mm-hmm. when you think about it. But let's start with the Valley and Alabama State game since I'm right there. We'll go around. Uh, the horn, if you would, in a lot of ways, around the circle. Um, let's start with Allen uh, mm-hmm. Valley at Alabama State. What it comes to mind in terms of this matchup for you? Well, if you watch Alabama State throughout the this season, and and what Dr. Hill Ely alluded to when you interviewed him on this show, uh, they lost last week. They'll probably win this week. Yep, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> that's a squarely a good way to put it. Let's go to you, Mike. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, I'd, I'd look for Ezra Gray to have a have a have a big game. I don't see him having two weekends back or two weekends back to back. Good point. BJ Jones, what are your thoughts when you talk about the Valley traveling to Montgomery to play Alabama State Hornets? Man, for Alabama State, man, you have to be ready to play this ball game. You're still in the championship uh, hunt. Uh, if you went out, you go. It's, it's as yeah. simple as that. Uh, so you have to play your best game. And especially, I think that front seven for Valley can cause some problems uh, for Alabama State. They get in Ryan Neville's face, kind of throw them off a little bit. I like Alabama State to win it, but I think this was going to be a close one. Mm. Charles Bishop, what did you say? I saw you nodding your head. It seems like you're uh, I, I, I think Alabama State is the perfect uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. High team. I think they'll be uh, ready to go next week. Like BJ said, you know, you control your own destiny. You, you went out, you go. Um, but uh, it's going to be a, a tough goal against Mississippi Valley. I think they get the win, but but Jerry Garner is going to find Ryan Nettles a couple times. I'm going to stay with you, Charles. Let's look at this Alabama A&M Jackson State matchup. Uh, Jackson State is playing at home. Alabama A&M has to travel on the road. Alabama A&M has had some success with Jackson State over the years, mm-hmm. uh, which is something to consider. Mayna is itching a bit. Can he keep those guys focused enough since they hadn't played in a long time um, in terms of game shape? Obviously, the last game they had against South Carolina State, they were able to put up some yards. Defensive side of the ball is struggling against uh, for Jackson State, but it's been more against the rush. What do you see in this matchup? Well, uh, number one, they will be focused because they're playing Jackson State. And it is what it is. And you're playing on, on national TV. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to be focused. I, I think they'll be ready to play. I, I said earlier, I think styles make fights. Uh, I don't think Jackson State physically can handle – teams like Southern at this point right now, or, or even Alabama state to that point. But I think in some ways they match up pretty decently with Alabama a and So I expect for this one uh, uh, to be a real nip and tuck one. And I think Jackson state's offense can kind of find their, their footing a little bit more against Alabama a Let me go to you, Mike. What are your thoughts in this matchup? Charles says that the matchup favors Jackson state in terms of be in this game a little more. Uh, what is your framework of this game? No, I, I think I, I do think that their styles and they match up fairly well against each other. But I, I think Jackson uh, Jackson State pulls it out in this one. I think their offense will get uh, on, uh, in a rhythm. Uh, I look for them to uh, pick up on what they losses. But I, I I don't I don't know if I've seen enough. I don't, I know I've seen an impressive Alabama A and M, and I've seen a different Alabama A and M. But I look for Jackson State to edge this one out, even though both teams are 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 evenly matched with maybe Jackson State to me having the edge. I just want to see Alabama A and M. Exactly. I don't know <laughs> if I have enough data points for Alabama A and M. That that's fair. With that said, Alan, let me see your thoughts in terms of the data point. Uh, do you need to see more uh, Alabama AM and m Jackson State, or, or can you break down some frameworks of what you thought in this matchup? All I can say is we will have to pay attention to if Gary Quarles and Quan Daniels get off from that running 
uh, game with Alabama A&M. If the big dogs up front for Alabama A&M start pushing around that defensive, that defensive line for Jackson State, it's going to be a long day. And I know Jalen Jones is out here trying to, to, to put his stamp on that starting quarterback position because, you know, he got some folks who are going to be ready to play come next fall. He is trying to own that position. So he's going to be out there trying to do too much, man. He's going to try and put, he gonna try and win this game on his own. And you cannot do that against a team like Alabama A&M. So if the Alabama A&M running game gets going, it's going to be a long day. Long day in Jackson again. It gets crazy mm-hmm. that to have two in a row. With that, BJ Jones put the cap on this one in terms of the matchup next week. What do you see going on I mean, between him and Jackson? With Alabama and let me ask yourself, is it rest or is it rust? I think, you know, that offense is predicated on timing. Timing that you don't have when you don't play. Because of that, I give Jackson State an edge there. The key is, like, uh, like we said earlier, you got to stop Garrett Quarles. Uh, and those running backs. If you can make Alabama and them one-dimensional, make this a passing camp game, uh, then, you know, I like Jackson State's chances. But if Alabama and them is able to fire off the ball and control the run game, as well as stop uh, uh, Jackson State defensively, it could end up being a long day in Jackson. No doubt about it. Anybody has the thoughts on Delaware State stepping out of the conference play to play Delaware? Delaware comes in at 3-0. and Delaware State is 2-1. and uh, it's on ESPN two. Any thoughts on anybody on that matchup? Anybody wants to jump in here on that? Glad to see Delaware State uh, yeah. hosting one of these games. Um, usually they're on the road to Delaware. Uh, good to see it on uh, on the big yeah. ESPN. The biggest thing for Delaware State, we've we've seen how improved they've been. How's that going to translate against Delaware, the Blue Hens, who are one of the best programs in the FCS right now? Yeah, I I I. I... I don't know enough about the analysis to, to really hinge it. I do I do like the fact that it's on ESPN, you know, and I like the I like the fact that it's a, it's on home territory. I'd be interested to see how Jared Lewis does this week. Can he put together two back to back successful weekends, even though he's playing a, a a big FCS opponent? I'd like to see how Jared Lewis does uh, in in this next game. He's he's played uh very well this season. I'd like to see him how he plays against a tougher opponent, even though he may or may not come out victorious. I'd like to see how the kid comes out. So I'm going to go with Charles and Allen. I'm going to go with you with the Southeast Missouri, three and four on the season, uh, playing at uh, Nashville against Tennessee State, two and four, as we just talked about. Let me start with you, Allen. Any thoughts in terms of this matchup next week? Uh, obviously, it looks like Tennessee State needs to find a way uh, to win this game. It's going to be a tough one. It's on ESPN Plus next Sunday at 2.30. And then I'll let Charles give his final thoughts on that. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think Tennessee State needs a win. You cannot finish out this spring season on this losing streak as they have, have as they're going into this, man. They need a win this week. Yeah, they certainly don't want to go two and five. That's not going to be a good statement. Charles, what are your thoughts in terms of that? Southeast yeah, Missouri. I, I can't say it any better. They, they need this win bad uh, for Tennessee State. Can you get Devon uh, Starlin up and going um, and, and get this W? It's going to be a tough one. Uh, but you know what? I, I just don't know what – I don't know what Tennessee State team I'm going to get. That, that's the frustrating part for me. I, I just – I don't know what I'm going to get from them. I don't know if they've uh, checked out on the spring. Oh, wow. That's a deep one right there. Well said. Last thing we have here before we close it out. The polls come out this week. This will be week number six. Let me give you all some insight to tell me uh, what the computer should do. Obviously, quickly, uh, receiving votes this week with Tennessee State Tigers. They're two and three, so they fall to two and four. Delaware State Hornets, one and one, they fall to, uh, excuse me, they improved to two and one. South Carolina State Bulldogs were one and one. They improved to two and one. Alabama State was one and one. They fall to one and two. Uh, nobody dropped out last week. At number five, you have the Southern Jaguar. They improved the three and one with one first place vote. Uh, you have number four, Arkansas Pine Bluff. They had one first place vote sitting at the third, fourth spot as they failed last week. They improved the three and oh. Prairie View did not pl- play. They were at number three, two and oh, uh, with one first place vote. So it'll be interesting to see where they go after not having a hiatus. Um, you got to believe that they're going to move around. At number two, you have Jackson State. They fall to three and two. 
overall two and two and uh, well two and one still in the conference race. That was a non-conference game. They had four first place votes. You got to believe their fall. Alabama A and M one and zero. Oh, we keep saying that they haven't been able to get back on the field. Five first place votes. Let me go with you, Allen, first. Any changes? What are your thoughts? I think you text me your thoughts yesterday, but you can share them with the world now. UAPB. End of discussion. <laughs> oh, let me go to BJ Jones. Another, yes, what are your thoughts on the top five? What do you want to see this week? Who's going to get the biggest jump or fall this week in terms of the poll rankings, in your opinion? I think you'll see Southern with a jump. I see you, think you'll see Jackson State with a fall. And I think, realistically, you need to see UAPB with a jump. I like what, what they're doing. Uh, people will get caught up on what that game yesterday looked like. But they won. They won, and that's the major thing. So I think that the Golden Lions should still jump this week. I like the way that you uh, put that in regards uh, to the fact that they won. And teams that are ascending and doing things, they win. Just like we had the concerns with Alabama State, they have concerns when they look like they are ready to win. They don't. So your, your point is well taken. Consideration needs to be with teams to get it done. Let me go to you, Charles. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts in the – Top five ranking, what do you think should happen this week? Whether teams are falling out, should a team jump into the polls that is outside of it? Uh, any thoughts in terms of the top five teams this week, in your opinion? No, I think uh, I think Southern will make the jump and, and Jackson State will fall. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one. But I think uh, UAPB, they are definitely uh, the, the best team probably uh, that I've seen th this spring. Um, I think Southern's right up there, but, you know, the head-to-head -head matchup, UAPB got them on that one. But um, that, that, that's probably the way it should go on this one. Mike, same question to you. Do you see any team that needs to fall out of the top five? Somebody needs to jump in there? <clears throat> any major changes? <clears throat> Somebody falling down, if not out of the poll? What do you see in yeah. the poll? <clears throat> Golden Lions, baby. Number one, UAPB. <laughs> As, as my Uncle Earl would say, home of L.C. Greenwood. So I think they are number one. I think Southern moves up. I think Jackson State falls. Unfortunately, because Prairie View hasn't played, I think they'll fall down as well. It depends on how the voters look at it. But they haven't played, so they may fall as well. So uh, you have Jackson State moving down. You have Prairie View probably moving down. And Southern moving up. And UAPB should be number one. Good point, good point. We'll see on Tuesday. Check it out. We'll have the latest and greatest of the poll rankings. We'll see if these gentlemen are correct. G. Boom Holly <laughs> said UAPB should move to number one as well. So uh, the fans out here talking about it, exactly. a and played only one game. When will Jackson State distinguish itself offensively or some comments that are out there? We've only been able to play one game in terms of Alabama a and Not a lot of film on a and &M for Jackson State to evaluate. Good point there. Uh, we When are we looking at probably seeing against uh, Valley? That means that the way we have not gotten where we need to be at uh, Bama State. So it'll be interesting in terms of that matchup some people were talking about. Am um, I the only person wondering what impact all four State would have had on the win-loss column across the SWAC? Yeah, that's the question. That's lingering out there. They'll get their chance in the fall. They made their own decision. And sometimes when you don't play, you don't get the kudos of folks focusing on you. So that's a little bit of their own doing in terms of the decision they made. The whole SWAT needs to work on special teams. Stephen A. Miller, yeah, it's hard to argue about that one. Wendell Davis said a blind dog can find a bone every now and then. <laughs> now some of these comments are going hard and heavy. So people – Thank you for chiming in. Much love to those out there. Eric Caver says, super happy that we don't have to travel to Valley next week. Hard to play down there. Yeah, great point when you talk about the difference in Valley teams. They do play totally different at home than they do on the road. That's a point well taken. With that, let's get out of here. Look for us on Tuesday. We'll give you the updates in terms of some of the other sports and the sporting news. Then, obviously, Thursday, we'll find a way to wrap it up and make sure you go into the weekend with things that you should watch in terms of the games that will be played this week as we start to narrow down the spring uh, 2021 season of the previous fall 2020. And then we can start talking about the new swag for the fall of 2021, which will have everybody interested. So 
We'll have a lot to talk about. Don't worry about that. We'll give you the greatest HBC news with that. Thank you for listening to Inside HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBC Sports with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop. On our weekend edition, we brought in the big guns. We have Alan Williams of 1876 Sports and Culture Podcast, and then none other than of the HBCU football analyst. Mike Washington calls him the HBCU football whisperer. Everybody else calls him just the expert. BJ Jones, getting it done for us. Appreciate having you regular. We got something special for you, BJ Jones, waking up early on these Sunday mornings. We're going to put it in the mail. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. That is Central Standard Time. Check us out on the weekend as we tend to do a special edition on Sunday, bright and early in those mornings. Check us out and stay tuned. Hit the subscribe button on our YouTube account so you'll know you'll get the buzz when it's time for us to go live. Uh, follow us, obviously, on Facebook on Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Twitter, we're right there on Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1. Or you can follow all of us on our Twitter accounts as we will give you great news. Check out BJ Jones tonight as he does his show. He'll go even deeper into the numbers and give you some indication on what you thought that he teased you with today. For me, Dr. Yada Cavill, follow me on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram, that's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Again, that's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles. Horse. Mike. Lecture. Dismissed. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>